begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for a new morning, good night's rest last night, a new day today. I pray that you would give us clarity of thinking, that your Holy Spirit would lead us into a deeper understanding of you. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I have a couple of sheets here for y'all because I don't think you had, you had a list of the words from before. There's one for you as well if you didn't get one. Okay. Uh, okay, I didn't know if you were here. If you got it, great. I made some because some people didn't have one. Did you get one of the list of the words? The list of the big words from the first day? We had ran out, but I made more. Yeah, I don't have that. You don't have that one? Okay, good. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a cheat sheet that will help you keep up with the, the words, the big words. Okay, to begin with, or to, we're looking today specifically at the Trinity. We're not defending the existence of the Trinity. We are looking more at the nature of the Trinity and uh, the relationship between the Trinity. To begin, we're first going to look at a few different theories that people have held oh, throughout history concerning the Trinity. And then we're going to look at the Bible to see what God has revealed to us concerning the Trinity and Himself in particular. So, uh, just as Greek philosophy understood God to be timeless, immutable, and impassable, it also viewed God as simple. It said God is simple. In other words, that means God has no parts. He is indivisible. He has no body. He has no soul. He has no matter. He has no form. It's actually his attributes that are God. God doesn't possess goodness. God is goodness. Uh, God does not possess omnipotence. He is omnipotence. God is simple in this way. That's the way that the, the classical view of God, God is simple in this way. Augustine and then later Thomas Aquinas assumed and defended this view of God in Christianity. Now, the Bible does not describe God this way. It doesn't describe God as simple in this way. God is pictured very much as a person, for lack of a better word, uh, not to mean human being, but uh, a being. He is a being capable of actually possessing different attributes, like goodness. So even though Greek-thinking people around Israel might have viewed God as simple in this way, the Jews did not view God as simple. Instead, they emphasized the oneness of God, which we're going to talk, look at in more detail in a minute. The oneness of God was set in contrast to the multiplicity of false gods around them. Thus, we see the Old Testament emphasizing God's oneness Though there are instances where in the Old Testament where his plurality also comes through. That's, that's in there as well. In the New Testament, on the other hand, um, that did more with emphasizing the plurality of God. God is made up of more than one. So the Jews of the early Christian church who became Christians had to deal with something of a shift in their thinking. How can God... They, 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 were, they had been raised with the idea that God is one, emphasized that one. God is one. And so they had to, when, they, when the New Testament era came, they began to, to need to change their thinking a little bit. How could God be both one and more than one? How is, how is that possible? How does that work? And as they pondered and discussed this question, naturally over time, the Greek thinking of the Gentiles who were coming into the church began to make an impact on Christian thinking. At first the church was fairly Jewish, but very quickly it changed to become more of a Greek and Gentile influence in the church. And so there, that thinking began to impact them. Eventually, the view of God called monarchianism or modalism answered this question. How can God be both one and more than one? 
They answer this question by saying that God has different modes of being. God has different modes of being. He is one being, but throughout biblical history, it said, he has revealed himself in three different modes or three different forms. So in the Old Testament, he was in father mode. And then when Jesus came, he was in son mode. And then when Jesus ascended, he was in Holy Spirit mode. You follow? That was the, the, the understanding of monarchianism or modalism. A different view called dynamic monarchianism, or also known as adoptionism, said, no, 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 that's not right. If God isn't in different modes, actually what happened is in the Old Testament, God was only the Father, and then Jesus, who was a mere man, was adopted by the Father at his baptism, and the Father made the Son into God. It's called adoptionism. So that was one, another way that they tried to answer how God could be both one and more than one. Another view was called tritheism, and that answered this question by saying, no, 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 the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are actually three totally different gods, which is a multiplicity of gods. They never were one. They're three different gods not one God. Then later came along Arianism. And this taught in the 4th century that the Father is one God and no one else can really be entirely like Him. The Son and the Holy Spirit, it says, were created by the Father and are inferior to the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit were created by the Father out of nothing, just like he created the earth, just he, I don't know, spoke them into existence or something. But they were not made from the same substance as the Father because he created them. Whereas the Father was timeless, immutable, and passable, the Son wasn't. The Son could change, the Son could potentially sin, and so on. Therefore, the Son really, truly couldn't be called God. So Arianism is, is anti-Trinitarian, basically. They say, no, there is no Trinity. It's just the, the one God. Out of Arianism arose semi-Arianism, which adopted most of Arius' views. Arius was the guy that promoted this. Um, it adopted most of Arius' view about God, except that this belief system held that the Son was closer to the likeness of the Father than pure Arianism believed. The Son, they said, was begotten in time. In other words, there was a point in time when the Son created, was created by the Father and was God. The Council of Nicaea in 325 AD rejected Arius' teachings. In fact, that was the big, the big teaching that the church went after in, in the early church when it uprooted three of the tribes, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals, right? They were Arians, and they said, this is heresy. And this took place after Nicaea in 325. The, the Council of Nicaea rejected Arius' teachings, and it said that the Son was not created in time in fact, he wasn't created at all. He was, they said, eternally begotten. In other words, the Father didn't create the Son, per se. The Son progressed from the Father from eternity. There never was a time that the Father and the Son were not because they exist outside of time. The Council also stated that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all of the same substance, and therefore they are all truly God. So it was taking something where Arianism had really swung in, a, in the wrong direction. It started to swing things back in a better direction. It wasn't perfect yet, but it, it, was, it was coming back in a better direction. So the early view of the early church theologians called the, the patristic um, uh, view of the Trinity, was that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the only way that they are distinguishable, they, they, they believed, was by their origin. 
In all other ways, they are the same. They are all God with the same powers, the same attributes. They are one center of consciousness, they said. One center of consciousness, one will together. Not three separate wills, one will together. One divine action, not separate actions. And also, as we discussed in classical theism, they said they are timeless, immutable, impassable, as well as simple, perfect, incorporeal, and some other characteristics that we're not going to even get into. The only difference between them, it says, is that the Father is God from whom the Holy Spirit and the Son were eternally begotten. Somewhere outside of time, they were always together. So as to speak of one of them is to speak of all of them. So far as we humans are concerned, there's no difference between them. Their differences are only in their origins, and that makes a difference in how they relate to each other. It really doesn't affect us at all. They are one single will, therefore they are near absolute oneness. They can't be separated into three separate consciousnesses. Okay, this was the early patristic view of how the Trinity worked. There are some problems with this view, however. If that view is true, how do you explain the incarnation? How can an unchangeable God be changed into man? How could a God who doesn't feel suffer on a cross? How could a God that cannot interact in time become a human and dwell in time? There has to be a better answer than the views that we've seen so far. So what do you say that we go to the Bible and see what God has revealed him to, about himself? How does that sound? Good idea? Let's go to the Bible, see what God has revealed about himself. Now, the Bible doesn't ever use the word Trinity. The, the word isn't in there. But both the Old Testament and the New Testament refer to God both as one and more than one. Some examples of the oneness of God that we find in the Old Testament, uh, we'll just re, um, go through a few here quickly. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Pretty clear there. Deuteronomy 4, 39 Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven, above and on the earth, below. There is no other. Okay? Oneness of God. Second Samuel 7.22 How great are you, you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And there's more passages that we could point to in the Old Testament. The New Testament also points to the oneness of God. Galatians 3.20, a mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. James 2.19, you believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. One God. Those are a few examples of the oneness of God in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. Here are some examples of the plurality of God in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. Genesis 1, 26, Old Testament. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So we've got plurality going on there. Genesis 3, 22, the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Genesis 11:7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Psalm 110:1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So you have Lord speaking to Lord. So you have a multiplicity um, there as well, plurality. In the New Testament, John 10:30, I and the Father are one. So you got two as one. 2 Corinthians 12, 4-6, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works in all men. So you've got three different um, names for God right there. 2 Chronicles, or, sorry, 2 Corinthians 13, 13-14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, so you got one there, 
and the fellowship of God, got another one there, and the, fe- or, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you've got all three there as well. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. And there are more, Matthew 3, 16, Matthew 28, 19, 1 Peter 1, 2, and so on. What we're seeing here is that God is one God made up of three individual parts. Together, they are God. Okay? But, people argue, how can 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal 1? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? How can 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal 1? Well, we're dealing with the inadequacy of human language here. But perhaps it's better to see this as actually as 1 infinity plus 1 infinity plus 1 infinity. What does that equal? 1 infinity, right? Infinity plus infinity plus infinity still equals infinity. That is a formula that actually does work. We have three co-equal, co-eternal, self-existent persons who together make up the Godhead, the Trinity. When, and when I use the word persons, we don't mean that they are human beings. We just don't have words to, to describe as well as we need to. Uh, even though human beings are made in God's likeness, God is not human. We're just saying persons to mean that each of the beings in the Trinity is a self-conscious, rational, has a will, has emotions. By three persons, we mean that they are three distinct centers of consciousness. Okay? That's in opposition to the patristic view that said they're just one consciousness, one will. Uh, There may be three separate beings, but they are so together that they are one. Here we're seeing that they are three distinct centers of consciousness. And it's understandable that those who view God strictly as one consciousness view Him as operating in different modes. Okay, if, if they understand God as one consciousness, okay, it would make sense that they might reason their way to modalism. While those who view God strictly as three might view Him as separate gods, tritheism. In order to avoid those two extremes and see God as three in one, we need to understand that it requires all three of them to be God. It requires all three. The Father alone isn't God without Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The three of them together constitute one God. The concept of their togetherness is key. So let's explore it a little bit uh, by looking at uh, (laughs) a, a question here. Um, with apologies to Bill Clinton, it all hinges on what is, is. True or false? Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens. Is that true or false? It's true. Mark Twain is, or was, Samuel Clemens. Mark Twain is the same person as Samuel Clemens. Mark Twain was his pen name. That was what he wrote under, but it was the same person, his pseudonym. Does the word is, in this case, have to be that way? Yes, it does, because is refers to his identity. Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens is the same person. The identity cannot be changed, okay? Now, true or false, Mark Twain is famous. Is it true? It is, but does it have to be that way? No. Mark Twain could have gone his whole life without being famous. The reason that he is famous is because something happened that made him famous. His fame is not his identity like his name is. See, so is is functioning in a different way in this particular case. They have technical names for this, but I'm not going to go into that. Now, let's apply this same example to the Trinity. God is Trinity. True? Yes, it's true. Does it have to be that way? Yes, it does, because is refers to the identity of God. God has to be Trinity. True or false? The Father all by himself is God. Is that true? No, because God is, by identity, Trinity. Three. So God all by himself is is not, or the Father all by Himself, is not God. Remove one of the three, and God 
no longer exists because the definition of God is Trinity. It is three. So here's an analogy. There are 535 members in Congress. Is any one of those members Congress all by himself? No, he's not. All of them together make up Congress. God is one, and it takes all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to be God. Okay? This was not a distinction that I had ever thought through before taking this class. This is interesting to me. And yet, even though together they are one God, they still act independently. They still make their own choices. Jesus made his own choices. Here's an example. John 10, 17 and 18. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life and only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord, he said. I do it myself. I do it of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up. This command I received from my Father. They make their own choices. Also, each one of them has different experiences. For instance, the Son was crucified, but the Father and the Holy Spirit weren't. They had different experiences in this um, rescue attempt. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove. The Son didn't. The Father didn't. The Holy Spirit had a different experience in that situation than the Father and the Son. So, the three parts of the Trinity are definitely revealed to us as individuals, and the three of them are definitely revealed to us as the one and only God. Is everybody following so far? Does this make sense? Okay. That there are three who make up God is shown also by the fact that God says He is love. God is love. Therefore, for love to exist, there must be lover and loved, right? There must be two to have a relationship between the people. The Trinity has had a relationship of love between them for all time. Uh, I got a kick out of his answer when the theologian um, by the name of Dallas Willard was asked, what did God do before he created the universe? And he said, he was enjoying themselves. He was enjoying themselves. If God was alone before creation, how could he be love? God is Trinity, and there is a love relationship between them. John 17, 24 actually says this, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. See that? There's a relationship of love between them before we came along. Just like our parents had a relationship of love before we came along as children. So in the classical view, God is only one center of consciousness. He has only one will, only one action. The only difference is in his origin. This is called the Latin view of God. A more biblical view is that three persons or centers of consciousness make up one God. Three persons are God with separate consciousness, separate wills, separate emotions, in relationship with each other, and this is called the social trinity or the relational trinity. One of the three is the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is unique among the three because of the fact that he became a human being and lived among us here on earth, which finally resulted in his crucifixion. That's why we see in Revelation 4 and 5 the enthronement of Christ. Nobody was worthy to open the scroll. Not the Father, not the Spirit. There was only one. Jesus Christ, uniquely qualified to open the scroll because he is the one that became a human and died to save humanity. So here we have the fact that Jesus was God, is God, and became a human has caused a lot of of discussion among theologians. Did Jesus take off his divinity and put on humanity? Or was he two separate persons? Was he one person with two different natures? How did that 
work. And big books have been written on this subject, and they don't agree with each other. We're just going to look at some of the Bible data, and let's see what picture emerges just from, from what we see here. We see a lot of examples in the Bible of Jesus' humanity. Um, and here's just a, you just have a whole list of them. Uh, John 1, 14, the Word became flesh. Jesus walked, talked, and lived like other humans. Jesus experienced hunger, thirst, weariness, pain, suffering, and death. Uh, Jesus asked for information. That's something that, that God wouldn't necessarily need to do. Jesus prayed to God. Jesus was tempted. These are all examples of Jesus' humanity, right? Jesus' uh, examples, or examples of Jesus' uh, divinity also include uh, the Messiah of prophecy, the revelation of God. Disciples called him God. His disciples called him God. The crowds called him Lord and they worshipped him. Jesus called himself God. The Father calls his Son God. Philippians 2.6 says that his nature is God. He's from heaven. Uh, he is the image of the Father. We see that in Colossians 1.15. He's all the fullness of divinity in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. He is pre-existent God, Galatians 4.4. 4. He is the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1. He is the everlasting Father, Isaiah 9. He is eternal, Micah 5. All of these are examples of Jesus' divinity. So just taking the Bible data, sorry that we just rushed through it so quickly, but Taking the, that Bible data, we can build a strong case for Jesus' simultaneous, simultaneous divinity and humanity, both together. Both natures existed in him at the same time, but he did not use his divine power on his own behalf. He accessed divine power just like the disciples accessed it and just like you and I can access it. Right? We often think, well, Jesus came and he was healing and, and he was making loaves and fishes and he was calming storms. I can't do that. You know, God was, he, Jesus was special because he was God. No, we need to understand that Jesus was not accessing his divine power as a human being. How could he be our example if that was the case? We forget that Jesus gave the exact same authority to his disciples when he sent them out, right? Right? And they came back and said, yeah, the demons are responding. We're healing. They were doing all the same things that Jesus did through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can access that as well. Now, Arianism and even classical orthodoxy would protest. They would say, wait a minute. You're the wrong conclusion. The Bible clearly says that Jesus was the firstborn and begotten of the Father. Does the Bible say that? Yeah, it does. So we need to look at this concept of firstborn and begotten. Arianism asserts that Jesus is a created being, and it points to some verses in the Bible to support this. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Okay, so there's, there, there's that word, firstborn. Colossians 1.18, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. So there we have firstborn again. Col or Hebrews 1.6, And again, when God brings His firstborn into the world, He says, Let all angels worship Him. Revelation 1.5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Okay, now the word begotten, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as that of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I had to switch versions here to the NASB to, to have that word, because the other ones use a different translation. No one has seen God at any time, John 1.8. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.18, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 1 John 4.9, By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. 
Uh, other translations have changed this to, rather than begotten, they say one and only. And there's actually a very good reason for making that change. Anti-Trinitarianism, like Arianism and Semi-Arianism, says that these verses must mean that Jesus was created or begotten at some point in time. In other words, at some specific point in history, the Father created the Son. And this would mean, of course, that Jesus would be some sort of a lesser God, if he's God at all. He, if some who believe that Jesus is God answer this question of begottenness by saying that Jesus was eternally generated by the Father. That means that the timeless Father generated the Son, but not in some point in time. There was never a, a point in time that the Father and the Son were not together. The Father and the Son have always existed, and the Son came from the Father, they say. This is the classical theistic view that we just saw a little bit ago. Others believe in Jesus' dynamic status, which means that Jesus is unique among the Godhead because of his status as, as Christ. Jesus is one of a kind. The dynamic status view says that the words firstborn and begotten are misunderstood in other views, and that we need to let Revelation define the terms rather than Greek philosophical assumptions or reasoning. The word firstborn in Greek is prototokos. And this can refer to birth, birth order. It can mean that he was born first. But it can also refer to the special status associated with being the firstborn. The birthright and the special relationship between the Son and the Father. It can refer to that. In Colossians 1.18, uh, it, makes the, it makes it clear that the firstborn position is one of authority, distinction, and responsibility. Let's just read this one again. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The firstborn from the dead clearly isn't dealing with birth order in this situation, is it? Firstborn from the dead. It's not, talking, it's not saying here that Jesus was born first. He's saying he was the firstborn from the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The first from the, from, born from the dead isn't dealing with birth order. It's dealing with the fact that he is going to be given supremacy. In Hebrews 12, 23, we are called firstborn. And we're not all firstborn here, right? To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteousness, men made perfect. Not everybody is literally the firstborn. So obviously the Bible is using the word firstborn in a different kind of way. In Psalm 89, 27, David was called the firstborn. But was David the firstborn? He was the youngest, wasn't he? He had seven older brothers before him. But it says in Psalm 89, 27, I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. So once again, the firstborn indicated his status. Also, God created everything through the Son. John 1, 3 says, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. To be literally firstborn, then Christ would have to have been created by the Father, right? To be literally firstborn, the Father would have had to create him. The Bible says that Christ created everything, so then Christ wasn't created. He couldn't create himself. So, the, that's, so that's dealing with firstborn. The other misunderstood word is the word begotten. The Greek word is monogenes. Begotten can mean born, just like firstborn can refer to birth order, but begotten can mean born, but that's not the primary meaning in Scripture. When you look through all of Scripture, the lexicon's first definition of the word is pertaining to being only one of its kind within a specific relationship. In other words, unique. 
Consider these verses that use the word monogenes. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only, monogene, son. His one and only son. Was Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? No, he wasn't. Well, actually, it depends on what you mean by begotten. He had more than one son, so Isaac wasn't the only son born to Abraham, but he was the son who received the special status as the son of promise. He was the beloved son. The angel specified to Abraham which son he was to sacrifice in Genesis 22, 2. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. He loved both of them, right? Whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Now compare what the father did for the son in heaven. Hebrews 1, 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. What happened here? Was there a day that the Father made Jesus his son? Yes, there was. That doesn't mean that the Father created Jesus, but there was a time when the Trinity divided itself up into three specific roles. One became the Father, One took on the role of Son, and the other took on the role of the Holy Spirit. Was this unprecedented? Yes, it was, in many ways. Because God, on a human level, um, I'm sorry, in many ways it's unprecedented because it was God, but on a human level, this happened, and it still happens. We do this all the time in human situations. Consider what Paul wrote to Philemon in Philemon 10. He said, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Interesting, right? So Christ, at some point, was functionally installed in heaven as the son, and later he became incarnate as part of the divine plan. Is everybody following me here? Something happened in heaven. He had a functional change in status. He was one of the Trinity, just like the other two, but he took on the role as Christ, Savior of the world. Any of the three could have taken on that role, but Jesus took it, took it on. He was the firstborn and the only begotten Son of God because the Trinity had decided on that plan as a way to save humanity. At that point, Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to the Father, and he even said so in John 14, 28. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. He's greater than I. Was the Father always greater than the Son? No, but some people say yes. What do they base that on? We're going to look at those perspectives. Okay, this is, were you here the first night when Dan Jackson uh, alluded to uh, how some people are talking about the subordination of Jesus and how he's some sort of a lesser God, a second-rate God? We need to look at that. He's right. This is something that we're beginning to hear rumblings on from certain quarters, and it's dangerous, very, very dangerous. Those who believe in the eternal generation of the Son say that the Son was timelessly begotten by the Father, meaning that Christ was created by the Father outside of time. The Son and the Father have always been together, but the Son has always been subordinate to the Father. That's what they say. It's not that at some point Christ voluntarily took on a subordinate role, but that ontologically... That means the very nature of God. I think it's on your sheet. Ontologically, that's the way the Trinity is set up, they say. The Father generated the Son, and that either the Father or the Father and the Son together generated the Holy Spirit, depending on which side of the filioque debate you're on. 
Now, to be fair, those who believe in the eternal generation of the Son claim that theirs is a non-subordinationist view. In other words, they say, this doesn't mean that the Son is subordinate to the Father. But when you think it through, how could one who originates in another be equal to him? It doesn't really even make sense. It's a logical impossibility. The Creator is always greater than the created. It's just that way. So really, by definition, their view requires eternal subordination of the Son to the Father, even though they may deny it. Now, others reject eternal generation of the Son and yet claim that the functional subordination of the Son is eternal. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. So they say that the Father didn't create the Son, but that the Trinity has a functional hierarchy which makes the Father the number one guy, the Son the number two guy, and the Holy Spirit the number three guy. They're all equally God, but for the sake of order, they need this hierarchy. You might have heard that one before. That begs the question, though, how can eternal subordination be merely functional? How is that possible and not ontological? The very idea contradicts itself. If it's eternal, it's his identity. That's the way God is. Again, we need to set aside our ideas and we need to go to the Bible to see in what direction the Bible and God's revelation points us in. Let's consider the following verses and follow the progression of what happens here. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with, with God and the Word was God. I tell you the truth, John 8, 58, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Colossians 2.9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So in these verses, all of them point to the idea that Jesus is fully God, right? Jesus is fully God. Next, we see some examples of hierarchy in the Trinity. First, Jesus asked the Father to glorify him the way that he had been before. And now, Father... Glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So Jesus had a certain glory with the Father before the world began, but something had changed. That's why he's saying, glorify me again. He had it, something changed, now he had it, he needs to have it again. What had changed? What had changed was that the Father had sent the Son. I have testimony weightier than that of John for the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me, and the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never seen his voice or seen his form. So the Father sent the Son. And John mentions in several other places as well that the Father sent the Son. So here we're seeing the Son in a subordinate role to the Father. Also, Jesus learned obedience. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. John 5, 9. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. John 5, 30. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. One more, John 8, 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own. I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. So all of this leads us to understand that there was a status change in the Trinity. Jesus went from equal to the Father to being subordinate to the Father. Now, some people accept all this, and they say, yes, 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 I see that Jesus was at one time equal with the Father, but when he took on this subordinate role, he is stuck with it forever in the ongoing future. Jesus will always be in this subordinate role, and they say, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 28. To to illustrate this, when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under his feet so that God may be all in all. But watch what happens. Later, the Father 
submits himself to the Son. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. John 5.22, moreover, the Father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. John 16.15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. The question we need to ask ourselves is why is all of this happening in the Trinity? What's the big event? The big event was and is a planet that rebelled against God and needs to be rescued. Therefore, the Trinity went into crisis action mode. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all equally God, voluntarily took on specific roles in order to accomplish our salvation. The subordination of the Son to the Father and the later subordination of the Father to the Son is all part of the Trinity's plan in the process of accomplishing our salvation. When salvation is accomplished, what reason would there be for continuing their roles? The subordination of the Son to the Father is not an ontological, but functional and temporary situation. There must have been the time when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit agreed to and took on functional roles in the plan of salvation. There's no difference between them. Any one of them could have taken on the roles. So in this light, listen to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, or maybe something to be maintained would be a good way to put it as well. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. See that? God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Built into the plan of salvation was the voluntary acceptance of hierarchical roles in the Trinity. Also built into that plan is the end of that subordination. And we can even see that happening at the ascension in Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we can see that the Trinity as a model is not a situation of hierarchy. Jesus, when, when his disciples, in fact, just last night, Jose was talking about it. He was saying um, how the disciples kept coming back to who is the greatest, who is the greatest, who is the greatest. And Jesus, when he finally addressed that situation, he said, that's the way that people without God do it. That's the way the pagans do it. Not so with you. Right now, we have a big discussion in our church going on about authority. And we need in the back of our minds to hear that echoing over and over again. Not so with you. Not so with you. And people are, in some quarters, pointing to the Trinity. And they're saying, God intends for there to be a hierarchy like this. He intends someone to be in authority. That's the way God works. But if you put all the biblical data together, that's not the picture that comes out of the way it works. The Trinity has taken on some roles of submission, but that's not the ideal way it's supposed to be. 